Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Understanding HUD Environmental Reviews webinar, sponsored by HUD's Office of Community Planning and Development, or CPD. My name is John McGaugh. I work for the National Center on Family Homelessness, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of CPD and the Office of Environment and Energy, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Today's webinar is Tribal Consultation about Historic, Cultural, and Religious Properties in Section 106, Review of HUD Projects. Now, before we begin, I would like to make some logistical announcements. Today's webinar will last approximately 90 minutes, and the webinar is being recorded. The recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be posted on HUD's CPD Environment page, the link for which you'll find in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. You can check the training website, which is the second link, for updates to this webinar series and for in-person training opportunities. The call-in information has been sent to you, and it is also listed in the upper left-hand corner of your meeting room screen under Audio Instructions. Another option is to use your computer speakers. This means that you will need to turn on and turn up the speakers on your computer. If you experience any technical difficulties, please let us know by using the Q&A box that will appear in your screen once we begin the presentation. You can also submit content-related questions using the same box. Feel free to submit any content-related questions at any point during the webinar. However, we will wait until the end to answer most content-related questions. Immediately following the webinar, you will be directed to a follow-up survey. Participants are strongly encouraged to respond to the evaluation to inform the delivery of future webinars, and we greatly appreciate your input. During the webinar, we'll, we will be asking poll questions, one of which you will see in the bottom of your screen now. Please take a moment to answer these questions, as well as the others we will ask throughout the webinar. Now, today's webinar will feature the following presenters, Nancy Boone and Catherine Au. Nancy Boone is the Federal Preservation Officer for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Before coming to the position a year ago, she was Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the State of Vermont. Catherine Au is an Environmental Specialist at HUD with a special interest in environmental issues affecting tribal and indigenous communities. Additionally, Chris Hartenau will be assisting Nancy and Catherine during the Q&A portion of our presentation. And now I'd like to pass this over to Nancy to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, John. I'd like to welcome all the participants today. I'm glad to see that we have participation by uh, tribal representatives and tribal historic preservation officers, as well as from other areas of government. Um, this webinar was originally presented to responsible entities as guidance for them in how to conduct tribal consultation during a Section 106 review of the project. And we're very pleased to share with you today what we have told and, and are telling those folks about when and how to consult with tribes. So we're going to try to uh, stress several things today, uh, an understanding of what the process is for tribal consultation in HUD projects, uh, what the role of responsible entities is in that process, and that we also have put out some new guidance on when to do archaeological surveys, and we'd like to uh, put that out so that people can understand what we're suggesting there. Specifically, we will go through some of the background, some of the legislation that led to Section 106 and HUD's implementing regulations. We'll talk about why and how responsible entities undertake environmental review on HUD projects, who the parties are, tribes as consulting parties, other parties. We'll talk about the Tribal Directory Assessment Tool, a new database that allows people to help identify who to consult with in the tribal consultation process, what we're advising REs to do in that case. HUD has recently issued a number of new or updated tools to help in the consultation process. The, the first and foremost is a notice of, on process for tribal consultation and projects that are reviewed under 24 CFR Part 58, and we'll go into more detail about what those numbers mean in a minute. 
We also, as I mentioned, um, have worked on a tribal directory assessment tool, a very helpful database. Also, uh, we will be looking at factors to consider in deciding whether to undertake archaeological studies in HUD projects, and then a new certification form that uh, REs must complete to certify that they have consulted with tribes and others in the Section 106 process. This webinar does focus on consultation, consultation between Indian tribes and responsible entities. And of course, Indian tribes includes Native Alaskans. Um, we are not covering in this webinar consultation with Native Hawaiian organizations. And we would refer people to the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's guidance for uh, further information on that. Throughout this webinar, you will see some of the links displayed on the screen as they are here in blue. And just for your information, those blue links are hot, are hot links at this point. And you can actually click on those, and the document or the reference will open in a smaller window. So a, a little bit about HUD and HUD projects. Here it states our mission, a very broad and important mission. 1930s, HUD was actually created in 1965, and we've been working towards these goals since then. HUD assists tens of thousands of projects each year, and those projects include new construction and rehab, community planning and development. Here you see two pictures, uh, some Indian housing funded in Alaska and a project in Washington State on the right. In general, assistance goes to state and local governments, tribal governments, nonprofits, and individual recipients. The National Historic Preservation Act, uh, which was passed in 1966, requires federal agencies to consider the impact of their projects on historic properties. And we'll go into quite a bit of detail about this. Many of you probably have worked with this process over time. The process is known as Section 106 review for the section of the Act that included the requirement. The Advisory Council on Historic Preservation set up implementing regulations for Section 106, and those can be found in the Code of Federal Regulations at 36 CFR Part 800. HUD has incorporated Section 106 in its regulations by reference. And those regulations can be found at, again, in the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, 24 CFR Part 58 and Part 50. Plus, I just wanted to point out that HUD projects must also comply with a wide range of other requirements in the 12 other areas listed here and under the National Environmental Policy Act in general. So Section 106 and this Historic Preservation Review is one aspect of a whole suite of factors that are considered an environmental review and HUD projects. And the one that we're talking about today is uh, Section 106. And you'll see a poll question here on your left. And if you'd like to just check off the, your level of familiarity with the 106 process, we can get a sense of how experienced uh, audience members are. It looks like uh, we have a range. We have a range of people. Uh, some are very familiar with the Section 106 process, but not all. So in basic terms, the Section 106 process consists of four steps. And in practice, sometimes the steps merge. Um, we, we always advise responsible entities that Section 106 is a collaborative process, where parties share information at, at each of these steps. And in the end, the agency official, in this case the responsible entity, decides whether to move forward with the project, even one with adverse effects. There is some uh, guidance on all aspects of environmental review, including Section 106, on the HUD website. And you see a, uh, a link here, which we hope that you will bookmark, a link to the Assessment Tools for Environmental C Compliance page. We call it ATEC. And uh, we hope that you will, as I say, bookmark it and refer to it often in the future. Another excellent resource for tribal consultation in Section 106 is the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's handbook, as listed here. Uh, this, this webinar is not a comprehensive overview of Section 106. It's focused specifically 
on tribal consultation, and you can find additional information at these sources and others. And I should just mention that we will be having, as part of this series, a general webinar on historic preservation, including Section 106, on September 12th. So we encourage you to look back and register for that one and join us if you can. So we, we talked about uh, the four steps of Section 106. And step one is to initiate consultation. And you initiate consultation with a variety of consulting parties who may, who may be involved, depending on the complexity of the project and the level of interest. The agency official represents the federal agency, of course, the applicants, the people who are uh, receiving the money, the people or entity who are receiving the, the funding assistance. Uh, the State Historic Preservation Officer, federally recognized tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations, tribal historic preservation officers, local governments, other organizations, the public. A Section 106 is not a permit process. It's a consulting process with a host of potential consulting parties. And uh, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, shown here on the list, oversees the process at the federal level and provides guidance for consulting parties and sometimes participates directly in consultation. Here, just a, a brief uh, definition of what consultation is. Our guidance stresses that consultation is a process, not a single event. We encourage responsible entities to start early, to allow time in their project schedule for meaningful consultation, and it may take months. Um, the goal is to seek agreement where feasible, as it notes here. Now we want to look a little bit more closely at who conducts the environmental review on HUD projects. Under Section 106, it's usually an official of the federal agency who is responsible for the review. By law and regulation, HUD projects are treated in one of two ways. If the program falls under 24 CFR Part 50, HUD staff handles the review of those projects. If the project falls under 24 CFR Part 58, the responsible entity is the one who conducts the review. And this applies to many programs, including the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, the Community Development Block Grant Program, the Home and Hope 6 Program, Public Housing, Section 8, and the HASDA. Under Section, under 24 CFR Part 58, REs, responsible entities, and I'll be using that term throughout here, REs, responsible entities, assume the responsibility for environmental review, including Section 106 and tribal consultation. We call it the Assumption of Review Authority or Assumption Authority. Our focus today is Part 58, and you can see a full definition of all of the definitions of responsible entity at the uh, citation that's noted on the top of this screen. But in general, you can understand that the responsible entity is the local, state, or tribal government that has assumed the federal agency's environmental review authority and responsibility for projects within their jurisdiction, including those for which they are grantees. For background, at the bottom of the page, there's a link to a legal memo that describes in more detail the legal underpinnings of assumption of review authority. Further references to assumption authority are found in the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation Regulations, 36 CFR Part 800. Um, you see a particularly, I wanted to call your attention to the head of the agency definition, uh, the second part of that, which notes that if a state, local, or tribal government has assumed responsibility for Section 106, the head of that unit of government is considered to be the head of the agency for purposes of the regulations. And that's something that will come up later, so I just wanted to point that out now. <clears throat> so the Section 106 regulations, as we know, require government-to-government -government consultation, federal agency to sovereign Indian nation. And for HUD, uh, for projects that are reviewed under 24 CFR Part 58, the responsible entities, those state, local, and tribal governments, have assumed the role of the federal agency in tribal consultation. 
There are different views on assumption of review authority uh, concerning tribal consultation, and this is HUD's view, that REs are directed and required by federal law and regulation to assume the role of the federal agency in environmental review of HUD projects, including tribal consultation. I wanted to just say a note. Uh, most of you are aware of the special status of tribal historic preservation officers in Section 106 consultation, and the notice that we've published points this out to responsible entities. Uh, in many tribes have tribal historic preservation officers who have been designated for their tribe, and they stand in for, they take the role of the state historic preservation officer on tribal lands and on projects that affect tribal lands. Um, in those cases, the RE consults with the tribal historic preservation officer, the TIPO, in lieu of the SHPO, unless the, the TIPO or a non-tribal owner of land within the reservation boundaries requests that the SHPO participate, or unless the project on tribal lands also has an effect off tribal lands. And in those two instances, uh, REs consult with both the TIPO and the SHPO. Um, a note here, our guidance, the guidance in the notice and our accompanying training, directs responsible entities to initiate consultation with tribal leaders and tribal historic preservation officers on projects off tribal lands as well as on tribal lands. We direct them to contact both. So the, the notice and our training give background to responsible entities on their responsibility to consult with tribes. Since 1992, the Section 106 process has included a requirement to consult with tribes. And basically, that requirement says that uh, one needs to consult with federally recognized Indian tribes, including Native Alaskans, consult about historic properties of religious and cultural significance to tribes, and to consult when a project may affect historic properties of religious and cultural significance to those tribes. In our guidance, we remind REs that there are over 560 tribes, including Alaska Native Villages and Village and Regional Corporations, that have completed the federal recognition process. We point out that a tribe's area of interest may not be limited to where they reside today. Many tribes were forced to migrate from ancestral lands to reservations far removed from those lands. We also point out that multiple tribes may have an interest in the same area, and in that case, multiple tribes would be participating in consultation. A word about non-federally recognized tribes. Although Section 106 requires consultation with federally recognized tribes, the responsible entity may also invite or allow participation by non-federally recognized tribes as well. Our guidance to REs explains that there's a wide range of historic properties of religious and cultural significance to tribes and that you need to consult with tribes to identify what those properties are and if, if there are, are any such properties in the area of the project. Here's a, a quick list of some of the uh, properties that could be considered. In our training for responsible entities, we have given some examples of those types of properties. So for instance, above ground remains of structures and villages as shown here on the left, below ground features and artifacts from thousands of years ago uh, as shown on the lower right, perhaps more recent buildings with significant tribal association. On the upper right here you see the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, which is a National Historic Landmark for instance, and plant and animal communities associated with tribal culture and life. And in the middle of the lower section of the screen, you see fishermen gaffing for salmon in Washington state. We point out that historic properties without man-made structures uh, may also be present. Uh, so that could include ceremonial areas. It could include sacred landscapes or features, for instance, where spirits reside. It can also include traditional cultural places, sites where elders gathered or may still gather, such as this meeting tree shown here. Um, regarding religious and cultural properties, there are a couple of uh, things that we would point to for additional guidance. 
There's some new guidance from the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, a questions and answers sheet, and the National Park Service, which administers the National Register of Historic Places program, is working on new guidance of, for evaluating and documenting traditional cultural properties. And as a matter of fact, right now, until the end of October, they're taking comments and suggestions that will help shape that guidance. And um, we, if you wanted to participate in that, you can follow the link at the top here to the questions and answers and find your way to that website where you can make comments. The notice contains a checklist to help responsible entities know when to consult with tribes under Section 106. And it's uh, called Appendix A, and it's based on when a project contains activities that might be of the type that would affect historic properties of religious and cultural significance to tribes. So if a project included these kinds of activities as you see on the screen here, you'd need to consult with tribes to find out if any such properties are present. I want to take a closer look at some of those. Among the kinds of properties that can affect, uh, excuse me, among the kind of activities that can affect historic properties of religious and cultural significance, a very obvious one is ground disturbance or digging. Um, if the ground is being uh, disturbed, if there's uh, the installation of new sewer and utility lines, foundations, footings, et cetera, those are the types of activities that could affect archaeological resources and others if those resources were present. Um, in the guidance here, there are examples of each of these kinds of activities, and that may be something uh, where we continue to expand examples over time. The second one on the screen here is work on a building with significant tribal associations, um, which can be uh, modern buildings uh, or buildings you know, from the 18th, early 19th, uh, early 20th centuries that have an association with a significant tribal event, a person or tribal community use. New construction in undeveloped natural areas can also affect uh, historic properties of religious and cultural significance. Think back to some of the large traditional landscapes out in the West. Um, Another type of activity that we point out to people is uh, if a project may introduce incongruent visual, audible, or atmospheric changes in an area, they have the potential for uh, affecting historic properties of the kinds that we're talking about. Here's an example of a computer model of the Cape Wind project in Nantucket Sound in Massachusetts, and Nantucket Sound in that project was found to be a historic property of religious and cultural significance that's eligible for the National Register of Historic Places because of its significance to the tribe in the area. Um, so these ideas of visual impacts, of noise impacts, light impacts are among the, the types that are uh, the types of activities that are considered. And then, of course, uh, the transfer, lease, or sale of properties properties that might contain archaeological sites or burial grounds, sacred places, buildings with significant tribal associations. So again, uh, sometimes man-made structures, sometimes natural features. We emphasize to responsible entities that they need to consult early before decisions are made. In June, HUD issued this notice on a process for tribal consultation in projects that are reviewed under 24 CFR Part 58. And that, that reference to the Code of Federal Reg Regulations there is the uh, set of environmental regulations that apply to this group of projects, this, this group of projects that, in which the responsible entity assumes the responsibility and the obligation to conduct the environmental review for the project. The notice is meant to provide step-by-step -step guidance for responsible entities on consulting with tribes in Section 106 review. And it supplements the general Section 106 guidance found on the ATEC website. And I just wanted to point out as a side note here that this notice on tribal consultation also allows for the use of existing local and state agreements uh, that uh, tribes may have already worked out with responsible entities and SHPO offices about tribal consultation. And any agreements that may be made in the future 
that respond to local circumstances and conditions and consulting party preferences. So this notice allows for those kinds of regional agreements to occur as well. The notice is organized in the four steps of the Section 106 process to make it easy to coordinate to the general guidance on Section 106. And the first step is to invite a tribe to consult and to help REs know who to invite. We developed TDAT, and TDAT stands for the Tribal Directory Assessment Tool. You see a link to it here. Basically, it's a database of all federally recognized tribes that contains contact information for tribal leaders and tribal historic preservation officers, if a tribe has a TIPO, and the counties where the tribe has identified current or ancestral interest. The information on counties of interest was gathered from tribes in 2011, and uh, Catherine is now going to demonstrate and explain the system. Hi, my name is Catherine Au, and I work for the Office of Environment and Energy at HUD. I'm here today to give you a demonstration of the TDAT tool. A link to the tool is once again provided. And if you want to search for the link later uh, by using an internet search engine, you can just type in HUD TDAT and click on the result that says TDAT version 2.0. This is what the main page looks like. It's pretty simple and straightforward, but there are a number of components I'd like to go over. The first is the address information box on the right, where you can look up a project site to find what tribes may be interested in that location. Then there is the search by state feature that lists the tribes with interest in a specific state or county. And I can see from the poll right now that um, most of you can list all the tribes with an interest in your state, but not everyone, and I hope that through showing you this tool, you'll all be able to find out that information um, on your own. Um, and then there is the Select a Tribe feature that lets you look up information for a specific tribe. And finally, there are some resources and information posted on the right. By far the most widely used feature of TDAT is the address information box, where you can enter an address and see what tribes are interested in lands in that county. It's fairly straightforward. You just enter the full address of the project site and click Find Tribes. I'd like to note, if you do not enter the complete address, an error message will appear. So make sure you enter the zip code as well. When you click Find Tribes, the results will look like this. There will be one entry for each contact person. In this example, what you see is actually three contacts from two tribes. Some tribes have only a tribal leader listed, while others have both a tribal leader and a TIPO listed. And then to go back to the main page, you just click on Return to Tribal Main Page, and you can also export these results to an Excel file to save them. The next feature is the searching by state function. Um, you can search a state or territory for a list of tribes interested in that area. You can do so by either clicking directly on the map or on the name of the state below the map. Both will lead you to the same place. The next page will ask if you want to specify a county or multiple counties within that state or US territory. Let's say I wanted to see all of the tribes located in that state. I would click on Get All Tribes for South Dakota and then the next page would look something like this. It gives me a list of contracts or contacts organized by tribe, which looks slightly different than results from the search by address function. This is what the results will look like in Internet Explorer version 7.0. If you're using a different browser, your results will look different, and they may look like this. The information is the same, but instead of showing all of the contact information, this display shows only the list of tribes. You click on the plus sign button to the left of the tribe's name to see the contact information for that tribe, like this. Then the plus sign becomes a minus sign, and the contact information for just that tribe is expanded. You can save these results by printing the current page or by exporting to Excel. If you print the current page, what prints is what you're looking at. So if you want all of the information for all the tribes on the page, you should expand them all. If you do not see the tribe you're looking for, 
you can click on the two or three above or below the results to see the next page of results. The tribes are organized alphabetically and displayed 10 to a page. And when I'm finished, I can once again click on Return to the Tribal Main Page. Or if I want to narrow down the, the search results, I can click on the button to the right that says Return to the Query Request Page for South Dakota. That will lead me back to the previous page, where I can scroll down and select the counties I'm interested in, and then click Submit. The next page will show me just the results for the county I specified. And once again, I can save by printing the current page or exporting to Excel. Um, now I'll go back to the tribal main page to search for just one tribe. To do so, I select the drop-down menu beneath Select a Tribe and scroll down to the tribe I want. I highlight the name I want, click, and the next page will give me the contact information for just one tribe. If I accidentally select the wrong tribe and want to go back and redo the search, I have to use the link below that says Return to the Tribal Main Page. If I use the back and forward buttons on my browser, the search information is still lodged in the browser's memory, so um, it might not work. Using the link on the page will guarantee that the search is reset and will allow me to run another search. Perhaps your tribe now has a TIPO who is not yet listed, uh, the tribal headquarters has moved and the address and phone numbers have changed, or there is a newly elected tribal leader, please let us know. You can do so by exporting the information for your tribe into an Excel file by using the button on this web page that says Export to Excel. And then the Excel file will look something like um, the graphic below on this next slide. Um, and you can edit the Excel file directly and then highlight all the changes you made in yellow um, and save the file and send it to us. If your tribe has interests in multiple counties, you might get multiple entries on the Excel file. It just means that you have a lot of tribes, and you can just update all the relevant columns. Um, the, complete the complete instructions for giving us feedback is located on the Feedback and Corrections portion of the website. And finally, I'd like to call your attention to the resources listed on the right-hand column called Related Information. The third link will bring up a copy of the new notice on tribal consultation that Nancy discussed earlier. So that's all there is to TDA, and I hope you'll find it useful. Thank you for your attention, and now I'd like to turn the presentation back over to Nancy. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, and I, I do encourage you to take a look at the info on your tribe now while you're thinking of it, or at, uh, rather at the end of this uh, presentation while you're thinking of it, and send us updated information if necessary. We're very committed to keeping this information up to date. So if uh, the tribe completed the checklist about when to consult and it indicated that the responsible entity needs to consult and the RE has identified tribes with an interest in the area of the project through TDAT, the next step is to write a letter inviting the tribe or tribes to consult. We provide a template letter to the responsible entities and in that letter they're required to add a project description, include a location map, that kind of thing. The letter asks, uh, the letter goes to both the tribal leader and the tribal historic preservation officer, as I indicated earlier. And the letter asks that the tribe uh, identify a principal point of contact for consultation moving forward, if that's possible. The letter uh, needs to be on the letterhead of the responsible entity, so the uh, city government, the county government, whoever is the unit of local government that has assumed the role of responsible entity. And the letter needs to be signed by the responsible entity official. We emphasize to, con to responsible entities that the letter cannot come from a consultant or a grantee. It must be from the responsible entity official. Um, just a footnote here, um, if a project is falls under Part 50 environmental review regulations, then the letter does come from a HUD official. The letter may be scanned and transmitted by email. We're trying to take advantage of technological communications. 
The notice lays out time frames for this initial step. It's HUD's policy to request an indication of the tribe's desire to consult within 30 days. And if the tribe does not, cons uh, does not have an interest or there's no response, then we're considering that the tribal consultation uh, is complete. Now, I would, I would really want to emphasize at this point that the request to tribes, uh, the invitation to consult, is just that. We're requesting that within 30 days the tribe indicate whether they want to participate in consultation or not. This is not a 30-day deadline to provide information. It's a 30-day deadline to indicate a desire to consult. Uh, again, uh, REs may invite non-federally recognized tribes to be consulting parties and non-federally recognized tribes may also participate as members of the public. While this invitation to consult is going on, REs are also inviting other uh, consulting parties and gathering information from other sources, the State Historic Preservation Office, local historical societies, et cetera. And the idea here in step two is to uh, share that information on known or potential historic properties with all the consulting parties, including tribes, and then to discuss whether those properties may be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. HUD recognizes that tribes possess special expertise in evaluating properties for the National Register. And as you know, National Register listing or eligibility is the threshold for consideration as a historic property under Section 106. We advise responsible entities that face-to-face -face meetings with tribes are always best, although we realize that it's not always feasible and we're looking to technology in, for ways to help facilitate meaningful consultation in addition to face-to-face -to -face meetings. We recommend joint consultation, but realize that there has to be flexibility in that when a tribe does not want to meet jointly or share information jointly. The guidance uh, treats the uh, topic of fees, as you know, uh, fees are not uh, part of, no fees are paid for two consulting parties for consultation per se. However, a responsible entity can consider paying for travel expenses to a meeting, for instance, or uh, if needed, if a, if a survey is being done and provided by a tribe, that expense can be considered a project expense, and if the grantee and HUD agree, it can be paid for as part of the project. The notice and our training stress to responsible entities that tribes may have confidentiality concerns about sharing information, and we tell the REs that they need to talk with tribes about how to ensure that sensitive information is protected. We advise them to look to protections afforded by practical means that can be discussed between the parties uh, to state laws and federal laws. We know that um, the REs need to be flexible. We know that sometimes tribes are not able to share information, for instance, at a particular time of year or information that is considered so private that it, it simply is not meant to be shared. And we're, we encourage responsible entities to keep talking, to engage in that consultation, to be respectful of concerns that people have about confidentiality. The National Historic Preservation Act and the implementing uh, 36 CFR Part 800 regulations include a federal process for ensuring confidentiality. Um, it involves the head of an agency, and as you remember back to the definitions, that includes the head of the unit of local government when we're talking about uh, projects that are reviewed by HUD under Part 58. That uh, head of the agency consults with the Department of Interior and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation about whether it's appropriate to prevent the release of information um, that has been shared during a consultation, and ultimately the Secretary of the Interior determines who can have access to that information. What happens if parties don't agree on National Register eligibility? Um, as, you, as you probably know, uh, 
it is always possible for parties to invite the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation to participate in the consultation and to be involved in that discussion about what is eligible and not. Um, on tribal lands, if a tribe and the responsible entity disagree, the responsible entity must obtain a formal determination of eligibility from the keeper of the National Register, and we'll talk about that in more in just a second. Off tribal lands, the tribe can ask the advisory council to request that the responsible entity obtain a formal determination of eligibility. And a formal determination of eligibility, commonly known as a DOE, uh, requires the submission of information that's pretty parallel to the National Register documentation, documentation, but without some of the more formal technical requirements. But it still requires that depth of justification and description about why a property is significant. Um, the process is outlined in detail, again, in the Code of Federal Regulations at 36 CFR Part 63. And it involves uh, submission of information about the physical, historical, and possibly spiritual aspects of the property with supplemental documentation and the opinion of the State Historic Preservation Officer. In June of 2012, HUD also issued a revised document, Fact Sheet Number 6, Guidance on Archaeological Investigations in HUD Projects. And I wanted to go into this in some detail because this is what responsible entities are going to be using as they consider requests. The document gives general background information and then lists specific factors that a responsible entity should consider in deciding whether to undertake an archaeological field investigation. And I'd like to go through those factors one by one here. The, the first and most obvious one is information received from the SHPO, the tribes, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And we're asking people to look and say, do sources corroborate the likelihood of sites in an area? If you have multiple sources all indicating that there's something important uh, potentially at the site, uh, people should consider that. We look at the likely impact of the project on potential properties. So if a project uh, site contains a potential historic property, but there won't be any impact on that property, then it's not necessary to document it with a survey. Uh, sometimes you see uh, potential sites identified in one portion of a project site, and that portion of the site is set aside as green space and not disturbed. In that case, since the project won't be, wouldn't be impacting the, the potential site, a survey would not be required. We also look at uh, previous ground disturbance. And if previous ground disturbance has destroyed the integrity of a potential site and compromised its ability, to yield information. We advise people to consider the likely significance of potential properties. Are the properties that are expected um, ones that would yield important information or otherwise qualify under the criteria for the National Register of Historic Places? We suggest that people look at the magnitude of the project and the degree of HUD involvement. So, uh, the, for instance, the cost of an archaeological investigation should relate logically to the value of the HUD assistance in the project while also taking into account the expected significance of the site. None of these criteria are uh, black and white or absolute. They're all factors to consider and balance. What is the public interest that's served um, by the archaeological survey. There may be a balance of public values and benefits. If, the, if human remains are anticipated, we recommend that a survey be done to identify the presence and boundaries of those uh, human remains and those burials. Of course, that should be done always in consultation with tribes, with the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and the State Historic Preservation Officer. And then the, the final criteria to consider, the final factor to consider, 
is the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's policy statement on affordable housing and historic preservation, which includes some direction about when to do archaeological investigations in affordable housing projects. And most of, of uh, many of HUD's projects fall into that category. So you see here that the guidance is that archaeological investigations should not be done for affordable housing projects where those projects are limited to rehabilitation with very minimal ground disturbance. Now, I want to point out, and we point out to responsible entities, that this does not apply to new construction. Um, there has been some confusion about in that in the past, but we make it very clear in the notice and the guidance now that this policy and this provision in the policy does not apply to new construction. I also wanted to just uh, point out for clarification another quote from the new fact sheet number six. Um, this is an excerpt from the fact sheet. And basically what it points out is that just because you have not investigated an area with a survey before does not mean that that area lacks historic properties. Um, follow the, we then advise people to follow the general Section 106 guidance on assessing effects. Here's an example of the various kinds of adverse effects. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with that. And then to make a finding. Um, and there are three possibilities for findings. As you know, no historic properties affected. And this is a, a little bit tricky sometimes because it means either that there are no historic properties present or there are historic properties present, but the project will have no effect on them. Um, you can also have a, an effect, a finding of effect of no adverse effect um, or of adverse effect, where one or more of the examples of the criteria of adverse effect apply. And once a finding has been made, all the RE notifies all the consulting parties. The parties have 30 days to object. And again, we point out that the tribe or the responsible entity may ask the advisory council to review the findings. The tribe has 30, a tribe has 30 days to object to a finding, like all the other consulting parties. And just a, a, a TIPO does not respond within the 30 days, the responsible entity can assume concurrence. Um, and that if the TIPO later uh, rejoins the consultation process, that finding or determination uh, does not necessarily have to be reopened. If there is an adverse effect, the responsible entity notifies the advisory council, provides all the required documentation, and invites the council's participation in consultation. And the council will respond within 15 days. It's a fairly quick turnaround. And when the council is deliberating on whether to participate in consultation, they look to the criteria for council, council participation that are found in 36 CFR 800. And one of those criteria is that a project presents issues of concern to Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations. The notice directs responsible entities to continue consultation to try to avoid, minimize, or mitigate adverse effects. And we encourage people to keep talking. The ideal is, would be that initially, if you find that a project may have an adverse effect, you're able to keep talking and come to compromises that avoid that adverse effect, at which point you could actually then drop back to a no adverse effect finding if you avoid it. However, if uh, a project uh, minimizes or mitigates an adverse effect that still exists, then the agreement that is reached is memorialized in a memorandum of agreement, an MOA, that details um, the stipulations that uh, are meant to minimize or mitigate 
those adverse effects. And you can see here the signatories who sign on to that, required signatories, the responsible entity, the advisory council, and the SHPO or TIPO on, on tribal lands. Um, beyond, off of tribal lands, the TIPO tribe and other consulting parties may also be invited to sign the MOA. And from HUD's perspective, the MOA is an essential part of the Section 106 process of the environmental review process and must be executed prior to a decision point for the project. Um, an MOA may include mitigation measures, which are developed in consultation with consulting parties, including tribes. Uh, these are some common ones that we see. The list is by no means all-inclusive, however. Um, we often see data recovery, uh, where excavation of a site is undertaken so that the information in the site is recovered before it's lost in a construction project. However, uh, I would just point out that the understanding is that um, letting an archaeological site remain in place is certainly the preferred alt uh, alternative. Mitigation can relate to resources affected by the project um, itself or other historic properties in a similar location or of a similar type. And I wanted to point out here at the bottom that responsible entities must make sure that the mitigation is carried out. And when that happens, they uh, have an obligation to inform the tribe and other consulting parties that those mitigation measures have been completed. Sometimes parties don't reach agreement and decide to terminate consultation. And in that case, final comments may be prepared by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Um, details on this process are spelled out in 36 CFR 800.7. And there's a, a link to that uh, section of the regulations in the notice. In general, on tribal lands, a uh, tribal historic preservation officer may uh, decide to terminate consultation off tribal lands. A tribe that's consulting about properties may decline to sign an MOA, but they cannot uh, initiate the termination of consultation process. Again, here's a reference to the head of the agency. When the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation issues their final comment about the impacts of the project, those comments go to the head of the agency. The notice treats unanticipated discoveries and instructs responsible entities to stop work and re-enter consultation if resources are discovered during construction. If, and there's a time frame, the, 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 uh, the, the work must stop immediately, and all of the consulting parties, as shown here, must be contacted within 48 hours. If human remains are discovered, the same applies with the additional notification of local law enforcement officials, because most states have laws regarding human remains and unmarked burials. Um, if this kind of uh, situation occurs, we encourage responsible entities to set up a site visit with the consulting parties to resolve any adverse effects. And if burials are involved, we refer people to the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's policy statement regarding treatment of burial sites, human remains, and funerary objects. And as most of you probably know, this is not, this is a consultation process. It does not prescribe an outcome. And that under the policy, certainly the uh, letting the burials, the human remains remain in place is the preferred alternative. The notice also has a section on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA, and it directs responsible entities to the National Park Service NAGPRA site for detailed notification and consultation requirements. One of the things that uh, is an important part of any HUD environmental review is the final request for release of funds form, 
which the responsible entity files in order to certify that they have complied with all of the environmental reviews and that all that the project should be approved and that the, the funds should be for the project should be released. Um, we recently modified, revised this form to include specific reference to Section 106 and consultation with tribes, with state historic preservation officers, and with the public. So that the old form required people to certify that they had complied with all the environmental laws as laid out in 24 CFR Part 58. Here they, they sign that they did comply with all the laws, but then they signed specifically that they complied with Section 106. And this ties consultation to the approval of release of funds for a project. You can see the form at the link that's provided there on the bottom of the screen. There are consequences for noncompliance. And here's a quote from the notice that uh, notes that uh, if a project fails to comply, there can be sanctions, corrective actions, remedies, including the possible termination of grants or repayment of federal funds. We recommend these resources to responsible entities who are trying to uh, engage in the Section 106 process and engage in consultation. Um, I'd particularly like to point out the bottom one, uh, Working Effectively with Tribal Governments course. It's a revised online course uh, put together by the Federal Interagency Working Group on Indian Affairs with leadership from a, a, an array of federal agencies, including the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, EPA, the Department of Justice, the Small Business Administration, GSA, and others. It's a very good uh, background piece for anyone uh, wishing to learn more about tribes and tribal consultation. And as with all questions about environmental reviews of HUD projects, environmental officers in the regional and field offices are a great resource. Uh, the link is for the regional environmental officers and field environmental officers throughout the country. Uh, my name is there at the bottom, and I'd also welcome you to uh, bring any issues to my attention that you think we should be looking at regarding this topic. So that is a, an overview of the tools that we have recently issued and what instructions we are giving to responsible entities. And now we'd like to pause for some questions. And uh, I will turn it back over to John. Great. Thanks very much, Nancy. And thanks, Catherine, as well. Uh, yeah, at this point, as Nancy said, um, Nancy will be taking questions. Joining her also is Chris Hartenau. Chris is the Environmental Clearance Officer and Senior Environmental Attorney, attorney in HUD's Office of General Counsel. He has handled environmental law questions at HUD for over 30 years and works closely with HUD's Office of Environment and Energy on issues under the National Historic Preservation Act. Chris has also participated in the negotiated rulemaking under NAHASDA for the original regulations implementing the Indian Housing Block Grant Program, as well as forthcoming revisions to the regulations. Now, as a reminder to all, you can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box on your screen. And Jim Potter from the Office of Environment and Energy will be reading them aloud. Jim, over to you. Thank you, John. The first question from the audience, Nancy. Uh, for a state community development block grant program, is the state or the responsible entity, is the state the responsible entity, or would it be the local government that has received a grant from the state? I, I think I will take that one, uh, Jim. Uh, for the state program, the unit of general local government that receives funds from the state is the responsible entity. So the unit of general local government would be responsible for consultation under 106. Thank you. Next. Does the mayor of the city need to sign the consultation letter sent to the tribal historic preservation officer? 
Thanks, Jim. We've, we've had some discussion about that, and within each responsible entity, there is a certifying official who is the person appointed to uh, be the signatory for all aspects of the environmental review. So that's the person who we are expecting will be signing the letter to tribes. Thank you. Next question. What should the responsible entity do if there is no response? Well, um, you know, I, I, I would say that if you really, if you expect that there may be a, an issue or concern, um, you're always free to contact the tribe again. Next question. If a tribal historic preservation officer and principal chief is listed for a tribe, do we need to get clearance from both? Well, as I mentioned, we, when the uh, invitation to consult goes to the tribal leader and the tribal historic preservation officer, we ask that in the response they name a single principal point of contact. Um, if they said that they wanted both uh, parties to participate in the continuing consultation, then uh, we would honor that. But we ask that they uh, have one principal point of contact for communicating in the consultation. Next question. Can tribes request an environmental assessment on fee simple lands, and I'll interpret that as, as privately owned lands on reservations, or is 106 specifically for federal funding only? Section 106 is triggered by federal involvement in a project. So I think it's, I think it's the latter. Thank you. Uh, Regarding artifacts, I presume it's from the archaeological discussion you had. Where will the artifacts go is the question. Well, I think that's part of what's determined in the consultation, what's appropriate. Um, certainly there are some uh, artifacts which may have spiritual significance, religious significance, and those might be uh, treated in one way and another type of uh, finding might be treated in another way. So I think that that is part of the consultation how and where artifacts are conserved. Thank you. Question is, so a memorandum of agreement can be a tool for the tribe to protect reservation, natural resources, and historic property on fee simple land projects? Well, the thing to remember probably in answering that question is that a natural feature needs to, to be Considered under Section 106, a natural feature needs to meet the criteria for classification as an historic property. So it can have religious and cultural significance and be determined eligible as a historic property, be protected under Section 106, be considered under Section 106, and ultimately some treatment of that resource might be reflected in an MOA. Thank you. A follow-up to the question about timing of responses. You stated that the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer has 30 days to respond. Does this also apply to the State Historic Preservation Officer? Yes, it does. Thank you. What suggestions do you have for the demolition of homes adjacent to a known burial site that are also in a local historic district and require local HDC? I'm not familiar with that acronym. Approval. Historic District Commission? Well, that's, that's a, a layered question to be sure, and the, the one that we're addressing here is Section 106. So if the project was, uh, in, if the project, that demolition, involved federal assistance of some kind, federal funds, federal permit, federal license, then there would be consideration of how the demolition might impact those burials. And in terms of identifying uh, properties that might be affected during a demolition, you would want to know about those burials. You'd want to know where they were. You'd want to know what the extent was. You'd want to talk about how to avoid any potential uh, effects from the project on those, on those burials. And a related question, can the potential for Native American remains trump the local historic district commission ordinances in instances where the homes are no longer eligible for the National Register? Well, you're talking about two different kinds of resources in that question. You're talking about buildings, which 
in the scenario described are no longer eligible for, national, for the National Register. But there may be uh, Native American resources which are eligible for the National Register and which then would be considered under Section 106. I think in, and in, in more general terms, uh, the ideal would be that the Historic District Commission was involved in the consultation and that everyone was working towards consideration of important resources and similar goals. Uh, next question. Is tribal land considered all land within an Indian reservation, or is it limited to tribal trust land, land held in trust by the federal government for the tribal or tribal member? I think we might need to get back to you on that question. Uh, we might need to clarify that with the Advisory Council. All right, another one. If the state passes funds to a nonprofit, is the state agency the responsible entity? Yes, yes. The nonprofit can never be a responsible entity. It's always a, a government agency, and in this case, it would be the state agency. Thank you. Next question. If the historic building was built by Russian settlers and was a trading post before it became a church for the native people living in the village, can HUD still help in, the, in preserving this? I think that what you're talking about is several periods, potentially several periods of significance, several areas of significance for the same resource. Certainly, uh, buildings are used by different groups by different entities over time, and each of those uses can be considered historic and important in its own right. When doing a Part 50 review, the tribe is still responsible to provide HUD documentation regarding the review. Why would HUD under Part 50 write to the State Historic Preservation Officer? Shouldn't the tribe do this and supply the response to HUD? I think we'd have to look at the particular HUD guidance for the program that's involved. Uh, under NAHASDA, there is a, a HUD, uh, HUD notice or a HUD memorandum which, which describes the information that the tribe will supply to HUD when the environmental review is done by HUD officially under Part 50. And we would need to review what the instructions are to the tribe regarding historic preservation in order to answer that question. Thank you. Another nonprofit question. Could a nonprofit organization apply for a grant on behalf of the tribe? And I believe they're discussing uh, Neighborhood Stabilization Program 2 funds. I think that's a program question that uh, is rather than an environmental question. We would have to, I think that question would need to be asked of the, of the NSP2 office. All right, next question. Tribal lands are defined by the regulations implementing Section 106 as, quote, all lands within the exterior boundaries of an Indian reservation and all dependent Indian communities, unquote. And the citation that the questioner has provided is 36 CFR 800.16X. And there's a link. Uh, fortunately, there's no question. Um, I think in response to the earlier question, and I'd like to thank the uh, the correspondent for providing that answer. Thank you for clarifying that, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, next question: Under a Part 50 review, doesn't the State Historic Preservation Officer require the submission to come from HUD? There are some instances <clears throat> when the agency can delegate the authority to initiate consultation. And that's done in a formal way with a letter that goes to the State Historic Preservation Officer informing them that that's what's happening. Thank you. I um, wanted to remind our participants that uh, you can submit questions. We've, uh, we've got a few here, but there's plenty of time for more. Next question. How is the contact information collected for the Tribal Directory Assessment Tool? And how will it be kept up to date? That's, that's, that's an excellent question and certainly one that's of great concern to us. Um, HUD undertook a contract with a consultant firm which contacted all of the tribes uh, in many instances more than once 
and asked for the current information about tribal leaders, about TIPOs, about contact information, phone numbers, addresses, emails, fax numbers, and counties of interest. And that was done, that project information was uh, being compiled until last September, September of 2011. And then we completed the App, the development of the application, which then, uh, as Catherine demonstrated, is able to call up that information based on locality. Um, we want very much to hear from tribes when information changes. And we're hoping that the system that is outlined on the TDAT website is simple enough that it won't be a burden for people to just quickly send an email when information changes. And our commitment on this end is to then get that information into the TDAT database so that we're constantly up to date. Now at this point, we know that there's a gap between when the information was collected and the present day. So we're particularly hoping that tribes will look at data for their tribes now and if it needs to be updated, to uh, take the opportunity now to send us that information. Thank you. Next question. When you say consultation should take place early in the process, how far in advance should it be done? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, sometimes when people are planning a project, they're already talking to consulting parties uh, trying to identify resources, trying to identify potential issues, even before they've submitted an application for funding or assistance. And um, so it can be that early. It can be pre-application. Um, but uh, certainly once the application is in place, once there is an undertaking, then the more formal process should begin as soon as possible. Thank you. Next question. If we have a problem with a specific tribe, that says they will not work with the responsible entity and will only work with HUD, what is your recommendation on how to handle that situation? Well, you know, I, I can take an initial stab at that and Chris can add if he wants to, but um, if, if a tribe does not want to consult with a responsible entity, then what we have encouraged in the, in the few instances where that has come up is we've encouraged the regional environmental officer or the field environmental officer to talk with the tribe, to talk with the responsible entity, and see if through discussions uh, people can agree to continue to consult despite the disagreement about who they're consulting with. That's a good answer. I think it's important to remember that the environmental review process is, is a unified process, not just for consultation under uh, Section 106, but also for all the other federal environmental laws like NEPA and their executive orders concerning floodplain properties and wetlands. There's the Endangered Species Act. And all of those responsibilities reside with the responsible entity. So as a practical matter, as well as a legal matter, uh, the decision-making authority is with the responsible entity and not with HUD. And that's that's where the consultation has occurred, so it must occur. So um, I think there's, uh, there's some constraints as to what HUD can do there. Thank you. Uh, another question about the TDAT system. Is there a way to identify areas of interest without receiving notifications for the whole country in the TDAT system? Yes, um, the areas of interest are noted at the county level. So you would say, I'm interested in these three particular counties in the state of Mississippi and this particular county in the state of Oklahoma, whatever it is. And those are the ones which go into the TDAT system so that a tribe is not notified for every possible project across the country, but only for projects in the areas where they've indicated an interest. Thank you. I had gotten one other question. Uh, I'd ask the, the participant for some clarification, but let me give you the question as it was presented. Does HUD apply the rules from Section 106 or HUD rules or tribal rules in matters of historic preservation? 
HUD, HUD follows uh, Section 106 as referenced within HUD's own regulations at 24 CFR Part 50 and Part 58. Um, and then we have issued a notice, which is another level of guidance um, to help people understand how they are to fulfill those regulations. Well, I think it's important to uh, point out that we, we do follow the 106 regulations, which is the, the regulations of the Advisory Council in, in 36, C, 36 CFR Part 800. I assume that's what the questioner meant by 106 rules. But yes, we, we do follow those. Next question. How are the areas of interest determined? Areas of interest meaning where there are not physically any tribes now, but they show up in TDAT. They are self-determined by the tribes. The tribes indicate where they have interest, and that includes Aboriginal lands, ancestral lands. Thank you. That's uh, all the questions that I have. OK, well, great. Uh, thank you very much. Nancy, Catherine, Chris, and Jim. And thanks, everyone, for taking the time to attend today's webinar. Again, please complete the survey so we can get your thoughts for future webinars. And also, as mentioned, the slides and recording of this presentation will be available on the HUD CPD Environment website. The links are provided in the web links box on your screen, and you can check the training page for updates. And once again, on behalf of the Office of Community Planning and Development, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, and this concludes the webinar.